Hi, my name is uh, Ilse Jerome, and I'm the Clinical Research and Information Specialist for MAPS, and that means that I read a lot of literature on our study drugs, and I help with the research designs for our studies, and I also work with the data. I do some of the statistics and presentation. So basically, I'm involved at all steps of uh, MAPS research. And I was asked to do a talk on uh, qualitative data in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And <clears throat> this, is, this is the talk here, learning from listening. It can also be, of course, from, from reading as well. But I'm going to discuss um, what qual qualitative data is and uh, at least give an overview of the history of qualitative data in in uh, learning about psychoactive drugs and psychotherapy, at least briefly, very briefly, and um, talk about what we're doing with um, a questionnaire that we have in our MDMA studies. Um, and our studies are looking at uh, reducing symptoms of PTSD via MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And, um, most of, I assume many people have seen other talks where the data is discussed, um, and I'm going to discuss data that isn't uh, perhaps presented as much and where we're going to go with it. Um, I think that science is partially about sharing stories, and we're definitely storytellers, perhaps even or definitely before we're looking at um, numbers. Now, I'm more of a numbers kind of person, so it's interesting that I um, was talked into or chose to do this presentation, but I think you need to rely on all sorts of ways of gathering information, especially when you don't know what you're looking for. You can't preemptively know what you're gonna find, all right? So, how do we study the experience, the drug experience? And this could be generalized out even further to how do we study the, the psychotherapy experience or, or any experience? How do you study it? You can look on the outside or you can look on the inside. Of course, there are specific details of the drug experience where you might want to look at, for instance, brain activity, like imaging or, or EEG. <clears throat> um, you can also look at physiological um, changes, for instance, changes in blood pressure, changes in the immune system. You can observe people, how they behave, uh, say on a driving task or how they speak with other people. And you can ask or find out somehow what is it like to be uh, under the influence. And I think, although I'm talking specifically about in this case, a psychoactive drug, you can generalize this to other situations. What's it like to have a certain type of psychotherapy? Um, oh, okay. So I may have jumped. Ah, all right, sorry about that. So when we look at brain imaging or brain activity, we've got ways to do that. You can, as I've described, you can uh, look at blood flow, you can look at brain waves. You can use um, a blood pressure measure or count immune cells. You can, um, there's some very complex behavioral things you can do like video recording something and having other people look at it or you can do simple things like just counting types of behavior. So what do we do then when we ask people or we want to know what's going on inside? That's perhaps a little less obvious. And there are a number of ways we can look at that or find that out. It might not be sufficient just to say, well, how does it feel? You can have self-generated narratives. Um, you can have structured reports or interviews where you specify, I want to know this specifically, but it's still a report. You can have uh, questionnaires or interview, uh, questionnaires or instruments which people complete um, or you can combine any of these, a report or an interview or a questionnaire with a very a specific situation, for instance, psychotherapy or other specific situations. 
So for self-generated reports, we've got autobiographical or fictionalized reports. Um, you can also have a structured interview um, where you pick out, ideally before you start, a specific set of questions and you try at least to ask those every time um, to make sure that you're going to get consistent answers. So those are two types of collecting data that you can use to learn about what's going on inside by asking people, what is your mood like um, when at the peak of MDMA or psilocybin? What were you thinking? And in this case, you're not leaving it up to the narrator. You're um, generating those questions first. There are also, oh, I think there's a little problem there, but there's questionnaires or instruments um, some have been designed to just look at um, alterations in consciousness generally. Um, some of those include the, I guess it's called the OAV now. It was designed by Dietrich and it's been used in research with psilocybin and MDMA by uh, the, the people in Zurich. Um, there's also the States of Consciousness questionnaire, which was designed to measure alterations in consciousness or non-ordinary states. And what happens in these measures are that you have a bunch of statements and you respond by saying, you know, either, yeah, that was like my experience, or sometimes you might use a number, say one is most like, or one is least like, and five is most like. Um, you can also have general measures that just look at what they call drugs of abuse or intoxicants like the, Addiction Research Center inventory, inventory, and that was designed to look at, an, I guess what they did is they took a bunch of drugs like stimulants and gathered a bunch of statements and decided that when you factored it out, you get different factors that support, say, stimulated or dysphoric, and they gave them different names. So that's very general. You can also develop a measure that's specific say to psychedelics like Strassman's hallucinogen, uh, hallucinogen rating scale. And that again has a bunch of statements and you indicate how, how much it was, you know, how much of the time it was like that. Um, and it has a, you know, a number, maybe up to a hundred different statements that you can complete. So those are some ways. So the last way in that you can gather this type of data that's not an interview or a report is to use something called a visual analog scale. And if anyone went to uh, Matt Baggett's talk yesterday, um, you could see an image of one of these. And it's really just a line. And you can have one word or two words. And you ask people, mark a place on the line that you feel best it represents your experience in relation to that word or words. I know this is probably more exciting to those who plan to actually collect the data, but I just want to show the variety of the ways that you can get this information. Now, I suppose we kind of move out again and say there's sort of two types of data. And one is qualitative and one is quantitative. And at its most basic, at its most basic qualitative data is descriptive and not numeric. And quantitative data is numeric. It's about numbers. And it's, that's really the most basic uh, description of the two without taking all of the, the baggage that people attach to one or the other. That's it. Uh, qualitative data is descriptive and it allows you to gather a lot of information. Um, on the other hand, it's difficult to compare different sets of information. So they each have things going for them. Um, what you can do um, with things like narrative reports is you can, oh, here I've, I, that should, you know what, I'm gonna come back to that later, haha. -ha. So here I've got the advantages and disadvantages. And the advantages, you can capture the whole experience and uh, you've got richness of data, and I'll try not to launch into my own particular interest here, but I think there's a bit of a tension between wanting to get richness of data, richness of the whole experience versus, sh I guess, uh, shareability 
um, which you can more readily get perhaps with numbers, and not in the sense of, of sharing a story, but in the sense of people know exactly what three is, and they might not be in agreement as much about a word. But when you use numbers, you lose that on that richness of a whole narrative, a whole story. So for qualitative data, you get that whole experience as a narrative, and I, I do think that humans um, are very comfortable with narratives. We tell stories and we find it easy to follow stories, so there is uh, the, the power of the narrative as well, which you don't get with numbers. And it's not limited. When, when I'm sure you notice when I discuss the questionnaires, a lot of work went into building those questionnaires. That's what makes them powerful, but it also sets some limits because in order to make those questionnaires, you have to have some idea of what you think is there to start with. Well, where's that idea gonna come from? Um, when you have qualitative data like reports or interviews, especially relatively open-ended ones, you're not limited by what you think is already there. And you might be surprised, of course you might not be, but you still might be. And um, the disadvantages are that there still is when you, when you um, have to actually distill the, the narratives or the interviews and you divide things, say, into codes or themes, you are gonna be unavoidably influenced by some idea of what you think goes together. Um, you also need often to have inter-rater reliability, just like with the numeric um, scale. And I actually have been involved, not with psychedelic research, but in my long ago past, and it's actually pretty tough work. You sit there with two, two or three other people, you've got a bunch of open-ended questions and you have to decide, is it this or that? And then if there are disagreements, you have discussions, why is there a disagreement? So you have to still get some kind of reliability between, between raters. And um, you still, if you want to do an analysis, say a statistical comparison, you are gonna have to bite the bullet and translate that into numbers. All right, no, I wanted to go back. And I wanted to discuss um, the history of qualitative data in, in psychoactive and specifically psychedelic drugs here. Some of the, some of the references I've actually enjoyed reading, uh, for instance, an account of early uh, mostly medical individuals describing their experience with, with, uh, with mescaline, I think sometimes peyote as well, but sometimes just the mescaline. And there may have been a, a narrative expectation that I no longer know and perhaps none of us know that was given in the 19th century, but you, you read a bunch of narrative reports and it, that way these are, you know, they were recording their experience and it was for them their first experience. You also have Hoffman's description of his first time trying LSD. And you have um, the narratives and snippets of narratives that are included in Shulgin's work. So this is how we can get information about a novel substance is first, you can't just slap a questionnaire down, you want a report. Okay, there are some relatively recent developments in how to deal with narrative data, qualitative data that I'm not as familiar with, but I think it's pretty exciting. And um, there is another talk that will occur uh, by Matt Baggett, uh, and he's an excellent presenter, and that will be at four o'clock. And they used a computer basically to see if it could decide what drug was being described by the patterns of word use or the, the types and numbers of word used. And so that's one option. You can also use something called discourse analysis, which I guess it's sort of like re-quantizing the, the qualitative data. Often what you do here is you get a set of statements that you think might be important and then you, you count when, when and how often they appear. That, that allows you to see the structure of the communication. And um, qualitative data gathering doesn't just happen with drug uh, research, as I already discussed. Um, it's again a way of learning about any experience and it's been used in psychotherapy as well. For instance, 
what did people with OCD experience while they were uh, undergoing a mindfulness program? You can even look at um, how people's experience as they described it matches up with a symptom rating scale. For instance, um, in depression, they use something called the, 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 de the Beck depression um, inventory, and that is used very commonly. It's a self-report scale, and it uses numbers, but they wanted to compare it with um, how people described it. So those are some of the ways you can use it outside of just drug research. You can use it for describing anything including psychotherapy. So has qualitative data appeared in uh, MDMA research? And I'm betting it's appeared a lot more often than this because I don't tend to follow it as assiduously, but I know that one of the first studies that I saw that interested me was, um, I'm not sure if I believe it was either a structured interview or surveys of, of therapists who had used MDMA themselves. and. Uh, then it described and categorized what they reported, and that's the, the lister at all 92. There's also an interesting booklet, I think it's called uh, Healing with Intactogens, and this was recounting the experiences of six patients who had undergone MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and what it was like for them. Okay, I'm going to go very quickly through these slides because I think most people here have probably encountered at least one talk where PTSD was described. It's a, a mental disorder. It's um, in related to experiencing a trauma and how you respond afterwards to that trauma, um, where you become um, hypervigilant hyper and you avoid any places or associations that are related to the trauma. People experience emotional numbing. They say they, they not really feeling anything, and I believe the official definition also relates to how long you experience this. Um, so why MDMA for PTSD? Well, we started partially because what we already knew, both in, from anecdotal narrative reports, which is essentially qualitative data um, about what MDMA assisted psychotherapy was like, including uh, an open label, which just means everyone knew they were receiving MDMA, an open label study of MDMA assisted psychotherapy in a variety of circumstances, and we knew the sort of effects it had. And we also looked at research in healthy volunteers, which is called phase one research, one of those geeky terms, but basically it's just research in people who don't have an illness, a uh, mental illness, and how do they experience it. And so then we were lucky to confirm uh, those initial hunches with studies. Um, why might this be working? Well, I'm going to talk more about the behavioral and experiential ends, and I'm not going to really talk about serotonin release just because Maybe the serotonin release causes these things, but we don't know. We, it's easier to talk about what people experience and what the brain does. And it seems to reduce uh, amygdala activity. And um, the, the amygdala is a part of the brain, and I don't have a cool picture to show you, but it's part of the brain that tends to be activated, especially with ambiguous and potentially threatening uh, things. Now, I know brain scientists out there are going to say it's more complex than it is, but we're not going there today. Just suffice it to say that reduced amygdala activity, especially when people who are already anxious, anxious seems to indicate uh, less disturbance or anxiety. Um, we know that there's increased feelings of trust or, or uh, people report sociability. We're, we're going to look at in the future, things like interpersonal closeness. I think other people have already started looking at that. So, and there's an increase in positive mood, which might seem irrelevant, but if you've got positive mood, um, increased feelings of trust, um, increased feelings of perhaps self and other compassion, that's going to increase something called the therapeutic alliance, which may turn out to be pretty important in how psychotherapy goes on. Um, for instance, if you trust the relationship more, you're going to be able to feel more comfortable re-experiencing or dealing with or grappling with any emotionally difficult 
things, for instance, your memories and feelings about a trauma. So that's pretty important. And so hopefully, and we've already seen, not just hopefully, but we've already seen some benefits of receiving MDMA-assisted psychotherapy within uh, people with P PTSD. What we use in all of our studies, and we started using this in our first study and we've continued to use it, is actually an interview. But it's a structured interview and in fact all the data is coded as numbers. It's not written down. It's called the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, which is, I think, pretty self-explanatory as to what it is. It, it's a scale of PTSD symptoms. And it codes for all the DSM diagnosed uh, elements. Uh, I gather that's going to change, but again, we're not going to go there. So why gather qualitative data about um, MDMA assisted psychotherapy? Um, well, so we can understand more about the experience because again, going back to the earlier discussion, what you can ask with established instruments is based upon what you believe is going on and suppose something else is going on. Well, you're not gonna spot it. You might, you won't be guaranteed to, but you might spot it if you have some more open-ended things like reports or interviews or even questionnaires that are just descriptive. Um, you might wanna capture any benefits or harms that aren't touched on if you're just looking at PTSD symptoms or even, and we've expanded our, our measures to include measures of depression, measures of sleep quality, but you're not gonna cover everything. That would just be too burdensome. So if you have a quick uh, questionnaire or interview, you can spot things that you might not spot automatically. And it might help us in standardizing and developing um, the, the method that is being used by the Midhovers and others right now. So uh, we're going to develop, okay, everyone knows what MAPS is. Uh, if you want to know more, you can ask me later, but it's a, what we're doing is we're supporting research into the therapy uses of uh, psychedelic drugs and MDMA and cannabis. And we have a plan to do research on uh, developing MDMA as a prescription medicine for PTSD. We're doing a lot of studies, as you can see there. Uh, several studies in the US, uh, studies in Switzerland and Israel. We have some that are under development in other places like Canada and Australia. And here are the people who, who started conducting the first US study, uh, Michael and Ann Midhofer, who generously allow us to present their data, but it is their data and their, uh, their work that I'm going to be showing. And this is the, the room, the setting, where the therapy takes place. And um, this is, I know, pretty, pretty chaotic looking. This is uh, the general model um, of all of our studies. And it's a model where you have conventional talk therapy that includes two or three sessions of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So first people are prepared for the psychotherapy, that's the, the preparatory sessions. And then they have the first session and an overnight stay, and you have what's called integrative sessions where you integrate what occurred during the MDMA sessions. Um, and um, then you also assess what to, uh, you assess the PTSD symptoms, and we are also including other, me other measures now, which we did not include in our first study, but are now being included, for instance, the states of consciousness questionnaire. But I'll leave this up a bit just to sort of, sort of show you that all of our studies pretty much have this structure if you're looking at an MDMA-assisted psychotherapy study. So it's not just that you have, you know, you give people MDMA and that's it. <laughs> And we've gotten, again, you probably have seen this data elsewhere, even presented by the Midovers, but we have gotten very promising results in a study of, that, will com that does compare MDMA with inactive placebo. We've also now looked at other active placebo doses. Um, one thing that we also did was we um, decided that we wanted to see how people were doing a year after their final assessment. And that's called long-term follow-up. That's what LTFU is. It's easy to just say LTFU and forget that people don't know what that is. 
Um, and what we did is we added this follow-up. The follow-up included a reassessment of PTSD symptoms, again, using that CAPS interview. And it included uh, keeping track of what therapy people had gone into or whether they'd gone back to psychotherapy, whether they'd gone back to the drugs they'd been taking for their condition, and also whether they'd used ecstasy after taking part in the therapy. And ecstasy is material that's represented as MDMA, and it may or may not be. But it also included a questionnaire. Yeah, we also included a questionnaire, and the questionnaire was devised to capture benefits and harms that weren't going to be included with the measures that existed. You know, it's not part of the CAPS, it's not part of those other measures. So we had, um, we structured it with uh, six questions that asked about benefits. Some of them were quantitative, some of them were numbers, you know, circle the number that best reflects how much benefit you experienced. Some of them were also that we just created a list of potential benefits, and then we mirrored it by create, sort of reversing the statements and uh, listing them as uh, potential harms. We had an identical set of questions about benefits and harms. We also asked people about um, whether they thought an extra session after all of the ones they had would have been good, and if so, would, have, would it have benefited uh, to have it soon after their last session or later? Um, we looked at their past and current drug and psychotherapy, which I think I already mentioned. Okay, here's looking at the long-term follow-up CAPS, the, the, basically the PTSD symptoms. And people pretty much stayed at the same state a year to three or four years later compared to their final assessment. Um, and I should also explain, it is a little more complex because when we did the MDMA assisted psychotherapy studies, if people had received inactive placebo or, or if they had the low dose, they were permitted to go to an open label arm where they did have a full dose of MDMA, in this case uh, 125 milligrams. So by the long-term follow-up, everyone or nearly everyone had had the MDMA. Our publication does describe the one person who didn't go to stage two just in, in narrative form, but here's the questionnaire data um, that we presented in the publication. Now what we did again is, it is qualitative in the sense that it's just descriptive, and it's also not addressing, say, directly PTSD symptoms, although we generated some, because you want to look at what else might have changed in their lives. Most people said general well-being, more self-awareness, um, those are the two of the top things, and those aren't included as part of the CAPS. Uh, Self-awareness is not an item in the CAPS. It's not a question that you're asked. We got to ask it, though. Um, so we want to further develop the questionnaire. Um, we've since added a question about recent stressful events, because you bring people back 12 months later, and of course things could have happened, and so we want to ask about that as well. And um, looking again at when we asked, do you think another session would have been helpful? Everyone said yes. In fact, some people just wrote yes for MP1, they just, which is the, our first study. They just wrote yes. Um, so some people thought it would be good sooner. Some people thought it would be good later. Some people thought sooner or later, it doesn't matter. They should just have an extra session. Now, one reason why we put a question in about ecstasy use or use of other drugs is because one of the concerns expressed by people who heard about the study is, well, you're giving people MDMA and aren't they gonna go and uh, try their drugs now that you've, you've shown them MDMA? And we wanted to find out if that really happened. And it did not really seem to happen. Um, only one person did this out of, out of the, the 20 enrolled and no one did in our in the study that happened in Switzerland. 
Um, so that doesn't seem to be a result of undergoing the therapy. So what are we, what are we gonna do next? Well, um, we want to add some items to this questionnaire that I've described. We're also, because we're interested in how many sessions people perceive as beneficial, we want to ask about the perception of that a third versus a second session. And we're also going to work in the final meetup where uh, the subjects meet up with Michael and Annie, with Michael and Ann Midover, um, to ask them more about you know why they chose or chose not to, if, if they say they used ecstasy or if they didn't, why did they choose what they did? Why did they um, think that they needed or did not need an extra session? Um, and to gather that information as qualitative data because that way we can learn more again outside the framework of the, the measures that we have. And that's what we're planning to do within this and other studies. Uh, another difference with our long-term follow-up questionnaires and, and the CAFs is that we are adding, or we have it in all of the studies really t to occur 12 months later because it's not an, an addition to the study that occurred while the study was ongoing. All of our studies now plan it in. And so we can get a good idea of uh, an actual 12-month follow-up, not 12 months to three years. And um, I guess I already described that to you. There's, there's the slide if you need to see it visually. But what we hope to do by gathering this information is to gain more of an insight of what MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in this situation is like. And also maybe it might come back to how we continue to conduct the therapy and we'll be able to answer questions about what sorts of psychotherapy people have and how they also like how they compare it to their past experience um, and that might help us understand anything specific or special or unique and also the commonalities of MDMA assisted psychotherapy with other psychotherapies that are out there and um, if you want to learn more about um, the research, then here are some of the websites that you can check out. Um, I, I understand that they've developed a really nice one for MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD that's specific to that. And um, I also wanted to really thank um, MAPS clinical team and um, Barry Zarklasinski, PhD, for letting me borrow some of her slides. Yeah, the really snazzy ones were not the ones I made. <laughs> like the one of the Midoverse and their their sessions, um, and Lene Ponte for helping me out, and um, Rick Doblin and all of the members of MAPS for being supportive of the research, and uh, the Midoverse for letting me share the data. So that's my talk, and um, that's it. So how would you go about creating a more quantitative version for other uh, avenues other than MDMA, maybe something more for psilocybin or LSD, and then really tapping into more of the, you know, of course, quantitative, having a larger study base? You're saying how, how would you create a qualitative questionnaire that's more general? Uh, well, yeah, for a qualitative one that is for a large number of people. Well, I think that's, that's, and that's, if you're looking at a large number of people, probably you're not gonna go the interview route because that's, that's time consuming. Um, so you would want to work with either asking people very specific questions or you'd want to generate more items that are going to be 
uh, more general um, and ask people just see if these describe your experience. And the list that we did was not only specific to MDMA, but it was specific to psychotherapy with MDMA. And the trick about qualitative data also is it's not just saying, ah, just tell your story. Although you can do that, but you want to often sort of direct it a little. So if you're designing a measure that you're going to use with a lot of people, I think if you're going to use interviews, you want just a few questions um, that you think about very carefully that are going to be inclusive enough of, say, psilocybin or LSD or MDMA without being so non-directive that it will be hard to deal with the data afterwards. You want to keep it short. Or you generate um, something that the people have to write on their own, or you generate a list of items, but you can't do the in-depth interview that you would do for a lot of the more standard qualitative data gathering, because that would be, unless you've got a team of hundreds, you won't be able to do it with lots of people. Do you ever do Skype uh, interviews? Sorry? Skype, like a televideo Skype conference? Oh, oh, you mean with, with the participants? Yeah. Right. No, we haven't done that. Is it, you think it'd be possible? I, I don't know. I think, remember that they're just speaking with the, the therapists, so um, bef there are some issues of, of confidentiality and comfort that the subject the subjects have with the therapist who remember they've they've uh, built up a relationship with the therapist for quite a few sessions and so if you did that i think you'd want to introduce that element pretty fairly early on um, i'm personally i'm not sure i'd be comfortable with having someone out of the blue skyping with the subjects but if it's built in perhaps from the start that's an option yeah In this particular study, were some of the uh, elemental factors that the people brought in beforehand, like diet, considered in some of your questionnaire? No, but that's an interesting question. Perhaps they should be. Assuming people will answer honestly. Um, so it sounds like all of the research that's been done so far is with individual psychotherapy and I was wondering um, what you think about the efficacy of MDMA assisted psychotherapy in groups, um, if there's any plans for that in the future. Well first of all wh what we think about it doesn't necessarily impact how quickly we do the research because we have you know the FDA and ethics boards to make happy. I, I've heard that group therapy has been efficacious. Um, and I assume that as we tackle the problem of individual psychotherapy and show, hey, it's, it's safe, it works, and I'm not sure that that will be used in phase three, but of course after it's approved, people can, can perform group psychotherapy. It would involve, of course, presenting a whole new study design, but um, along the road, I'm sure that can be done. Uh, a lot of it depends on, like, this, the current study kind of coming in on a, a study that's already under underway, and so adapting to, the, using the qualitative to help complement the data that's uh, being gathered at the follow-ups, and uh, it'll be a little different. I mean, if uh, I would encourage anyone who's thinking of doing, if they're starting or thinking of starting a clinical study of seriously giving thought to the development of a qualitative uh, that goes along with it, to whether that's feasible or not. Um, so I think there's unique challenges with, depending on uh, where you're coming in on the process. Well, yeah, definitely, and also what you want to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Um, one thing that you mentioned that I thought was really interesting was um, how qualitative data from past uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy sessions before beginning to use it for PTSD was sort of the, sort of um, informed the decision to see if it would work for PTSD because of the qualitative data that was uh, being collected. And so I'm wondering if people are now looking at the qualitative data coming out of the PTSD studies and thinking about what other uh, disorders or diagnoses uh, this sort of therapy can be used for. I know obviously uh, it's been started a little bit to be thought about in autism, but I'm wondering if people are thinking about other uh, dis or diagnoses it can be used for now based on the qualitative data coming out of the PTSD studies. I'm sure they are. I'm sure we'll hear about it when they talk to us about what they thought 